about the candidates. I'm Chris Castile and I'm here in the Oklahoma studio in downtown Oklahoma City with Republican State Senator Stephanie Bice, who's trying to unseat Democratic Congresswoman Kinder Horn in the 5th District. We had Congresswoman Horn on last week. That, uh, that video should be on the Oklahoma.com and our YouTube channel, as will our one with, with Senator Bice uh, later today. Uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, we have Democratic Senate candidate Abby Broyles. And on Thursday, Republican U.S. Senator Jim Inhofe. Again, those will be on Oklahoman.com and uh, our YouTube channel at some point after they air. Uh, Senator, thanks so much for coming in. It's good to see you again. Thank you for having me. Can't believe it's three weeks to go. Um, it's been a marathon and a sprint, right? I mean, you you were you announced I think in April of 19. Is that right? And April 24th of 19. Of, of 19. That's right. So there's the marathon part. Now yep. you got to find that kick, uh, that last kick for the, to finish this race. Three weeks, 21 days. You know, it's it has been an interesting uh, journey announcing last April and then going through the beginning of this year and then COVID sort of put a screeching halt to I was going to ask you, what, what has it been like to, to campaign in the age of COVID? You've run two state Senate campaigns, which are pretty big campaigns, mm -hmm. uh, big districts. So what's this been like? Um, it's different. Um, I think that for me, the campaign was then cut into chunks. You we really hit the pause button back in March when COVID presented itself and things began to shut down in Oklahoma. So from middle of March to really beginning of May, we really didn't do much um, from the campaign side because mm -hmm. we were really focused on uh, making sure that we were being uh, cautious with what was happening. And so that made it unique in that when, when things began to slowly reopen in May, you had really May and June before the primary election. Right. And then you had the primary and then you had July and August to run that runoff election. So mm -hmm. you, you, it was almost broken up into chunks these last right. um, couple of elections. Well, you guys were pretty active even, um, you know, in those, uh, maybe, maybe not in the spring of 2019, but later, mm -hmm. fall of 2019, I went to, I think, three or four forums that uh, some of you appeared at. So you really have been campaigning for, for quite a while. Yeah, we had been holding d uh, various events across the district. And mm -hmm. when COVID, you know, hit, we decided certainly to pull back. We, you know, knew that there was some challenges there. And I was focused uh, on the state Senate side, making sure that constituents were getting right, out and get information. In session. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And so we were putting out a lot of information, talking to folks about um, unemployment issues and how to f apply for that. But then also we had to really make sure that we were uh, doing, you know, enough to voter contact on the campaign side. And so we used technology to our advantage. Mm -hmm. We started doing Facebook town halls. We did Facebook Live. We did some Zoom calls. I had a couple of uh, folks that wanted to do a Zoom meet and greet. Uh -huh. And so I never would have thought that we'd be using Zoom uh, in a congressional campaign the way that we have over the last several months. But it was effective and it got people that aren't comfortable or you know um, want to be cautious about getting out the opportunity to sit and listen to my um, my hopes for the future and also ask questions about what they want to see in a congressional candidate it worked out really well Good. well we'll definitely get back to coronavirus but I wanted to um, let, let you talk a little bit about yourself um, I, I know that you you're a, you're local you're born in Oklahoma City 1973 tell me about where you grew up what part of the city you're from so I was born and raised in the Oklahoma City metro area, uh -huh. I, um, North, North OKC, went to Rollingwood Elementary School and um, graduated from Putnam City Original, which is the Pirates. Mm -hmm. My uh, parents were divorced when I was young and my mom got remarried uh, to a really great guy. Uh, my, uh, my mom and stepdad have, uh, my brother and sister are quite a bit younger than I am. So my family is all here locally with the exception of my dad. My dad actually now lives in Florida. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it was, a, it was a tough upbringing in some ways. My mom uh, at one point was a single mom trying to you know, put food on the table. And sure. that you made it How many siblings at that door? Well, at the oh. time I was an only child oh, okay. uh -huh. uh, before my mom got remarried. And so you know, she was trying to, to take care of you know, me and make sure that there was food on the table. And, so I think that's one of the things that I think about when I'm you know, looking at legislation or talking about issues with families is I know, you know what it's like mm -hmm. um, to, to struggle and what it's like to um, you know, be a single mom working, trying to provide for a family. Yeah, yeah. So went to Putnam City Original, graduated from there, 
Uh, I often say when I'm giving campaign speeches that the school colors for PCO are orange and black. Oh, so that's why you chose them. So I stuck okay. with them and I went north to Oklahoma State, uh -huh. even though my entire family uh, are diehard OU fans. And you're wearing OU red. I sort of am yeah. wearing OU red. I thought, well, I think this is red, not crimson, <laughs> okay. right? Okay. But um, yeah, I, I thought this is the place for me. So I went north to Stillwater and my um, major was marketing. Mm -hmm. I think I always knew that I wanted to be in sales and marketing in some capacity. So that was my path. And my junior year, um, I met a guy <laughs> and um, we uh, started dating, and we've been, we'll be married 25 years. Congratulations. Actually, in January. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, it's been, uh, it's been a great journey ever since. And while you were in college, I mean, what, what sort of activities, you know, kind of outside class things? Did, were you interested in student government? Did you? No. <laughs> you know, I was never really um, engaged in politics other mm -hmm. than voting in every election. And I, was when I was 18 years old, I registered as a Republican. Mm -hmm. uh, I was involved, I was a member of Alpha Chi Omega sorority, uh, so shout out to my sorority sisters <laughs> out there. Uh, and very involved in that, I held various leadership positions within the house, and that kept me really busy. Uh, but school was my focus, yeah. and uh, I was, I've graduated in four years, four years in a summer. And one of the things that I share when we're talking about, you hear a lot about education, higher education and tuition and, and loans, uh, I, my father was able to pay for my first two years of college. Mm -hmm. And after my sophomore year, he called and said, hey, I need to tell you that I'm out of money and I can't pay for school anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I had to figure out, you know, how do I finish college? I was the first one to graduate from college in my family and I knew it was important because it would give me a leg up. So I went back to Stillwater, trucked over to the financial aid office, mm -hmm. asked for an application, filled out student loan papers, uh, got myself a job, and I put myself through school. Mm -hmm. Finished the last two years in a couple summer classes. Yeah, so. and a lot of us did that same thing. Of mm -hmm. course, I, I tell people the most that I can remember paying per hour in tuition was $30, and people, you know, it's laughable. I mean, what I've what I've paid for my kids, uh, you know, <laughs> be like one year was all four. So um. I remember I, I took out two loans uh -huh. that were fifty-five hundred dollars a piece for the for my junior and senior year, and that's all you could take out. That was the maximum, uh -huh. uh, and then I had to, to pay for the rest. But I had eleven thousand in student loans uh, when I left Oklahoma State, uh, and I, I took my time paying them off. But um, but it was worth it. Yeah, that would be actually a pittance compared to what what some get out with now. It's yeah. unfortunate. Yeah. Um, so, did you? I mean, did you find a job right away when you when you came back? Did you come back to Oklahoma City? Is that? I did. You, yes, yeah. came back to Oklahoma City. At that time, uh, I was engaged. Mm -hmm. I, um, we're planning a wedding, and I came back and started working at a call center for Southwestern Bell Wireless at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, worked there for a couple of years. And then I got into the sales side of things, and I did sales for you know 15 years before. Um, we, I was given the opportunity to work for my father's business. He started a technology company in New York in the mid 90s. And about 2004, after the birth of our second daughter, he gave me the opportunity to work remote, which was great. Uh -huh. you know, trying wow. to juggle. Head of the curve. Yeah, yeah right. Try, trying to juggle uh -huh. kiddos and, and a work life balance. So, went to work for him. And over the next several years, I did pretty much every job that you can imagine in the business. That would have been right there with that develop, kind of the tech boom, right? That's exactly that right. Period. So yeah. I was doing, you know, I was in the marketing space. I started uh -huh. doing digital marketing for the company at one point, but I also did sales. I did purchasing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in 2008, my dad called one day and he said, we have a problem. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, our controller at the time had been using the line of credit um, to essentially uh, pay operating expenses for mm -hmm. the business. Mm -hmm. And the line of credit had been exhausted and we had no cash flow. And he said, I need you to take over the finances while I uh, figure out how we're gonna get out of this. And I said, hey dad, I'm a marketing major, you know? <laughs> and he said, I know, but I know you can do this. And so I did. I you actually, had to have taken some accounting and I, finance. I did take some, yeah, yeah, basic accounting classes. Uh -huh. So uh, I ended up taking over the finances and, you know, um, it's a blessing, but that company is still 
thriving today. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, but my dad jokes with me that I got a real world MBA. I didn't need to go yeah, to, yeah. to grad I mean, that's, school. <laughs> that, that's true. I mean, if you were handling that, uh, that range of activities at a small company, that really would have been the case. Yeah, I think you know as a small business owner that you really do everything. Yeah. You're a jack of all trades, and I certainly was in that business. And I took that experience and ended up starting my own company, uh, doing digital marketing and consulting work mm -hmm. for companies. And that was here in Oklahoma City, that right? Was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and were you doing that when you first decided to run for the Senate? I was. Uh, and, what, <laughs> and how did that come about? I mean, what, if you, here you've been involved in business all this time, and your engagement with politics was mainly to vote, I guess. Mm -hmm. what, what, what was it? I mean, was there some kind of moment where you go, I'm, I, I've got to get involved because this is a problem? Well, someone asked. Mm, okay. <laughs> and what I found out since I've been elected is that oftentimes, women do have to be asked to run. Mm -hmm. I think for some reason, we don't see ourselves in those positions. We see ourselves in leadership positions in other ways, mm -hmm. whether it's through our you know, faith community or nonprofit community, but you know, we don't really envision the opportunity to serve um, in a legislative capacity. Although at this time, Fallon would have been, you would have had a woman governor at correct. this point. Yeah. That's correct. Uh, the sitting senator at the time, he called me one day and said, I'm not running for re-election and you should consider running for my Senate seat. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't know the first thing about <laughs> running for office. I've never thought about it, uh, but tell me more. Mm -hmm. And he was a great um, resource for me. And I, very quickly, I think I decided, you know what? I could make a difference for Oklahoma. And I also thought it was a great opportunity for me to really show my daughters not to be afraid to do something big and bold and outside the box. Right. And how old would they have been when you... They were, were 9 and 12. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> funny story about that, after my husband and I had had lots of conversations and he was very supportive, mm -hmm. I wanted to tell my girls, you know, what I was about to embark on and what it looked like running for a public office. So my oldest daughter, who was 12, we were in the car one afternoon and I said, you know, Isabella, I want to share with you something that I'm going to be doing over the next several months. And I sort of laid out, you know, what it would look like and what I would have to do. And that I may be gone a few nights a week, you know, knocking doors and campaigning. And I remember vividly sitting in the car. And after I explained it all, I asked her, I said, you know, what do you think about that? And she sat for a moment and pondered. And she looked up at me and she said, why not? <laughs> and I thought it the was... The wisdom of children. I mean, you know? <laughs> you know, They can just put it so yeah, <laughs> so simply. Yeah, so I thought that was pretty amazing that the 12-year-old, you know, yeah. sort of thought, well, why would you not do this? Uh -huh. Why not take a chance? And so I did. What's, just, you know, just quickly, what's it like for them to see, you know, because of those state races, you wouldn't have been hammered by um, Club for Growth or, <laughs> you know, the DCCC or you know, whoever it might be, what's it like for them in this campaign to have seen, you know, this, this barrage of anti-bias ads? Um, it's, it's challenging sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, our oldest daughter is away at college, so I think in some ways she's a little bit insulated from the everyday, um, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. ads that you see. She's not watching television. Um, I don't know how many people are watching a lot of television. A lot, it seems like a, the young people these days are watching a lot of Netflix yeah, and yeah, Amazon. Right. And so she may not see it as much, but my younger daughter does. And uh, she's also a little bit interested in politics, mm -hmm. um, which my husband says, well, you know, that's your doing, uh, dear. <laughs> but <laughs> she, you know, she takes it in stride. I think my husband is the one that probably takes it the hardest. When you see mail pieces, you know, you mentioned Club for Growth. Mm -hmm. When you see a mail piece coming to your door that, you know, calls your wife a liar you know, or says that she's, you know, doing, you know, doing things for the wrong reasons, you know, I think that can be really tough on a spouse. Uh, he had to get off of social media for a while, yeah, a while yeah, back, because yeah. it's just tough. But, um, but my younger daughter, I think just, she's got thick skin, mm -hmm. probably like her mom, and she just kind of lets it roll off of her and says, eh, I know, I know the truth, and uh, that's not going to dissuade us. So. I assume they were all supportive of you making this race, too, even yeah. though it might mean might mean weeks away at a time, um, depending on what your schedule is Sunday through Thursday. It's normally Congress members either leave on a Sunday night or Monday morning. Mm -hmm. They're usually back on Thursday night or Friday morning. And that's really mm -hmm. um, similar to the legislative calendar here, mm -hmm. right? Um, right? I'm fortunate that I represent a district that's 20 minutes outside of Oklahoma City. So 
when I ran, I was able to still drop my daughters off at school in the morning, and then someone would pick them up in the afternoon. Uh, but most nights, if I was home, it was business as usual, cooking dinner, you know, sitting mm -hmm. down as a family together, uh, enjoying the evening. And it, it is the same on the state level as in, in D.C. Votes on Monday afternoon, we wrap up on Thursday, and so members go home. Yeah. And, you know, that's what I intend to do uh, um, in Washington is come back home. I think you should be back here. You know, this is the place that you represent. This is where the constituents are. Uh, it's best to be on the ground, you know, uh, engaging with them to find out what's really happening. Yeah, that was a total shift when I first went up there. Um, when I moved up there uh, to the Washington Bureau in 1990, almost everybody lived there, almost all the members of the delegation. That's where they lived, that's where their kids went to school. Um, and within the, within like four years, there's almost nobody that, that had, they, they all just kind of went to rent an apartment. Uh, and I'm flying back and forth all the time. They, you know, Lucas was was among the first to do that. Is took. You know, they mm -hmm. um, they had small kids and uh, they they didn't want to move their families to to the D.C. area like congressmen in the in the past had done. So and yeah. since then, it's been that's been the model is that you fly back and forth all the time. Yeah, and I think it was great. Um, you know, pre-COVID, mm -hmm. there were at least two or three flights every day back and forth from D.C. One day, I needed to be in D.C. for an event. I actually flew out that morning and flew home that af that evening. Yeah, I've taken that flight, too. It's great. <laughs> yeah. they, is that still now, COVID, available? Now, COVID, I don't yeah, think I it don't is know. right now. I think, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, air travel has been significantly impacted because of COVID. So you don't have any, that I'm aware of, any direct flights to D.C. I haven't been to D.C. since February. So yeah. um, so we'll see you know, if and when they're able to resume those again. Uh, but that does make it a lot more convenient for folks having to go back and forth. Yeah. So I want to get back to COVID, um, and you know, today it was announced that there's, you know, we're running out of ICU beds in Oklahoma City. I mean, the, and had I think one of the highest case numbers uh, statewide, um, you know, since this started. And I was just wondering, I, mean, I, I know that you that you've been kind of on the, you were on the inside on the state part of it. Um, but, but tell me, like, how you, I know you said in the primary that you thought the Trump administration had handled it well. I'm, I'm not sure I've ever heard you um, weigh in on how Governor Stitt has handled it, but how has government handled this? I mean, do you think in a, in, as a whole, do you still think Trump handled it, you know, after getting, after he got sick and all those White House people got sick? I mean, we still say that he sure. handled it well. Well, there's a couple things to, I think, look at here. First of all, it's easy to armchair quarterback, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you can look back and say, well, we should have done this, we should have done that. And the, and the president, along with Congress, took some immediate action to try to, you know, stem um, the spread. Certainly, we were short on PPE and other things, which is a supply chain issue, particularly dealing with the Chinese and them, you know, not being willing to send us um, any of those supplies and also not being willing to let us go over and really investigate what was happening. Mm -hmm. I think that exacerbated, you know, the fact that we didn't know a lot about the disease early on. Uh, I remember very clearly people talking about, uh, you know, not touching the groceries, having to wash and sanitize everything yeah, because you yeah. just didn't know. Right, right. And, and that was pretty common. Mm -hmm. Now we know a lot more about the disease. Now we know, you know, that it's airborne and it's not necessarily touching things. Uh, so we learned a lot. You know, you, you mentioned the president and, and his, some of the staff getting COVID. They had some pretty strict protocols in place at the White House. Mm -hmm. Everyone was being tested. Everyone was having their temperature checked as they came in the door. Certainly, we now know there must have been some, some gaps. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've got to figure out how do we stem that. On the state level, you know, people are taking precautions as best they can. The most important thing, I think, is we have got to be protecting the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. If you look at the statistics across the country, a majority of deaths are happening in that over 55 to 65 population. And oftentimes it's nursing home residents right. that are being impacted. So we've got to do a better job of making sure that we are uh, focused on those populations, providing every you know um, uh, supply that they need, personal protective equipment and otherwise, to keep everybody, employees and those residents safe. Uh, we've, I think we've done that. Certainly the governor's tried to stockpile PPE to make sure that we're able to give it you know, to those facilities that do need it. Uh, but we've got to really, I think, ramp it up right now and, and take more 
um, personal responsibility in making sure that we're wearing a mask. You and I wore a mask, you know, coming in today. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to social distance um, as best we can when we're in certain situations uh, and being responsible. That's what this is going to take until we get to the point where we get a vaccine for this. And I think we all recognize that that's going to be really, um, you know, the most effective thing in in stemming the COVID-19 spread is, is getting that vaccine. And the president invested a lot of money with several different pharmaceutical companies to try to, to get something out quickly. I believe there's now five uh, pharma companies that have a vaccine in production or in, I'm sorry, in phase three trials mm -hmm. uh, that we hope to see in the next, you know, 60 to 90 days. And I think that's going to start, hopefully, um, we'll, we'll, will see. You, will you feel confident about getting one when, uh, you know, when they, whether it's J&J &J or Moderna, whoever it is, I mean, will you feel, okay, I'm, I'm ready to. Yeah, I think these, these, companies, these are not just being vetted by the FDA here mm -hmm. in the U.S. They're being vetted internationally mm -hmm. by a lot of different uh, countries. And so, yes, I think they will be safe and effective. The way that the process has been sped up, um, it's actually been a focus for the FDA. So normally when you're putting a drug through the process, it's a much more lengthy process, not because they're testing certain things, but because it just takes a while. Mm -hmm. This is a focus, and the FDA is putting all their efforts into making sure that we get this drug out as quickly as possible. And it will be safe. Otherwise, it wouldn't be put out in the market. Right. I want to ask you a little bit about the CARES Act and you know, Congress's role in this and in, in trying to deal with both the health aspect and the economic fallout from it. I know um, you said that you would have voted for the CARES Act, and you've said now you guys need to use the rest of that uh, paycheck uh, protection program money um, that's that I think is a, a few billion that that is sat there 184 billion um, what about the like what about the unemployment uh, piece of that which wasn't part of the cares Act. I think that was actually in a separate bill the six hundred dollar um, uh, federal benefit that that was sup you know, supplemented the state mm -hmm. benefit do, do you think that were you did you support that would you uh, support doing that again I think that we should have been utilizing um, some cost of living parameters mm -hmm. or potentially looking at um, capping it at the maximum salary that you were making mm -hmm. whenever you, you became unemployed rather than just the flat $600 uh, because you actually ended up paying some people to stay unemployed. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly people needed those dollars. Mm -hmm. They needed to be able to have the resources to you know, take care of their families during this really difficult time. So yes, I would have supported it initially. Now I think we need to reevaluate. You know, in Oklahoma, we've got 5.7% unemployment right now. And 5% is considered full employment. That doesn't mean that there's people that don't need the help. Uh, but, I, but I think we have to be really thoughtful about when we're approaching this from a uh, from an unemployment standpoint, if we're paying, for example, the you know 350 a week on the state level, if we supplement that another you know couple hundred, and it's it's putting them at the same salary that they would have had in their previous job, that should probably be the goal, mm -hmm. not paying them more to stay home. Okay, so um, <clears throat> Senate Majority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell said today that he's willing to make another run at kind of a bare bones type package where, you know, of course on the house side, you've got a much more expensive package. Other than PPP, what, what do you think? I mean, direct payments? I mean, what, what, what do you think should be an, an element of any minimal CARES, uh, I mean, uh, Relief Act, whatever it's gonna be called this time? Sure, well, the stimulus, unemployment, federal unemployment stimulus mm -hmm. supplemental should be part of that conversation. Uh, certainly PP, uh, PPP should be part of that conversation. And here's what I would also offer up, and I think you mentioned it briefly, there's still money sitting out there. And I think that, you know, that the speaker is being grossly negligent and at least not allowing that bill itself to come up for a vote. Mm -hmm. You know, it's no additional dollars to the taxpayer. It was dollars that are already appropriated that are just sitting there. And there is a pathway to do that, but she's unwilling to even put that up for a vote because she wants to look at funding other things like uh, funding to municipalities, many of which are um, 
municipalities or cities that have huge pension liabilities, mm -hmm. and they want to use those dollars to fund that. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the state and local aid piece. I mean, do you think um, there's any need for uh, more state and local aid uh, in Oklahoma? There's still actually dollars out there that haven't been spent mm -hmm. on the state and local aid front. So let's utilize those dollars first before we start having these conversations about needing more. Mm -hmm. um, at least for Oklahoma, that seems to be the case right now. I do want to make sure that when we are looking at another package that we're also being mindful of the needs of our schools because schools have been impacted on two fronts. Right. They're not only needing personal protective equipment and cleaning supplies and space, you know, they may need additional space to be able to make sure that kids are social distanced, uh, but they also need um, connectivity. Mm -hmm. And in some areas of the state, even in the 5th District, there are challenges with connectivity. We broadband, don't have, we do not have like broadband. Seminole and Pot County? Yeah. And, um, so we need to be thoughtful. We should say, I'm sorry to interrupt, that, oh, that this <laughs> district, the 5th District that you're running for, includes most of Oklahoma County, but all of Pottawatomie and Seminole County, which is Shawnee and Seminole. Correct. I'm sorry. Nope, nope. That's, that's yeah. a great sort of uh, um, catch there. But you know, I would also say it's not just rural, though. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about Oklahoma City Public Schools and some of those um, low-income families, they may not have internet access at home. So how are we making sure that those kids are getting um, a quality education, especially considering that right now OKCPS okay, uh, made the decision to go virtual for the first nine weeks? Mm -hmm. That sort of adds a layer uh, for them that they have to overcome. And sure. I think we need to be making sure that they're able to you know, provide students with either a one-to-one -one device to be able to work from, or you know, some sort of um, program that they are allowed to access to be able to do their homework or, or um, continue to, to you know, learn during this virtual time. And then obviously most of the education money that came through the, the federal relief um, packages went to public schools, but there was a bit of controversy that Governor Stitt directed 10 million of that money to private schools. What was your feeling about that? You guys were out of session, there was nothing, I'm not sure you would have had any say in it uh, anyway. Yeah, but, we wouldn't have had any say um, in that, and I think the majority of the dollars did go to public schools, which was the right decision. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you know, the private schools are also impacted by this, and mm -hmm. so, you know, you have to be thoughtful in that. This is about kids, mm -hmm. period. We got to make sure that kids are protected, that kids have access to resources, that the teachers that are teaching in those schools have access to resources, PPP and otherwise, PPE and otherwise. And so, um, you know, he made that decision. It was his to make as um, the you know, executive of the state. And I think he, um, you know, chose to, to do that based on the information that he had in front of him. Probably you, you might have mixed feelings about the, uh, the idea of having this new health lab uh, in Stillwater, um, I know some Oklahoma City uh, members of the legislature aren't that crazy about it, but what, what's your own feeling about it? I think I have concerns, um, and you know, I think that we need to be uh, looking at what's in the best interest of the state. Um, if, if there is a, a, a real fundamental reason for moving that to Stillwater, then it's certainly worthy of a conversation, but I think the um, concerns that many of my colleagues in the legislature have are that we weren't, it wasn't a discussion. I was going to say, that's it was a, a unilateral was decision. Anybody, was anybody consulted? Any of the Oklahoma City people? Not, uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh -huh. I wasn't consulted, nor should I be necessarily, but I think it would have been nice to at least have a conversation mm -hmm. around um, what the whys, why we feel like this is in the best interest of the state of Oklahoma, uh, what the benefits may be fiscally or otherwise, because I do know that there's um, a discussion around cost savings. There's already some infrastructure, I believe, in Stillwater that's set up that would lend itself to having a health lab there. Again, um, you know, that, that can play into this, but we really, as legislators, weren't given a lot of information about it had, um, before the announcement. And, you know, I've had constituents that have reached out to me in the last few days that were uh, employees of the health lab mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that are pretty shocked. Yeah. You know, and so I, I certainly think a couple of my colleagues are looking at putting forth some legislation that may put, you know, pump the brakes, if mm -hmm. nothing else, mm -hmm. to make sure that this potential move is in the best interest of the state. Yeah, there was no study that, that any of us know about anyway, but mm -hmm. let, me, let me shift to healthcare real quick. Um, this is obviously a topic you're, 
used to talking about. Now, you, you oppose the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, and um, you know, a lot of times that probably wouldn't matter with the Republicans, uh, even in, when they were in the majority, they weren't able to um, repeal it, but now you've got it before the Supreme Court again. You know, um, it's not clear how much of it might fall, depending on how they rule, but a good portion of the ACA may fall based on how the Supreme Court acts probably next spring on this. You said that you do want to protect people with pre-existing conditions, and I'm just, I, I just have not heard you say how that would be done. Would the government tell insurance companies you have to continue to cover these people? No, and let me let me also add, you know, you mentioned uh, the ACA case that's mm -hmm. before the Supreme Court right. and the potential uh, repeal, but I think that's also highly speculative. You know, no, we don't know is. what's going to happen. I think there's uh, a lot, that. and that's why the Democrats are focusing so much of their questions on um, during the, the um, Judge Barrett's um, mm -hmm. confirmation hearings on that case, because once you lost Ginsburg, then I think there was maybe, because a lot of the, the some of the previous de decisions were five to four, mm -hmm. with Roberts rescuing it for the for the supporters of it. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have a lot more concern now about it with uh, with Ginsburg Be being passing. off the court. But yeah. I, again, I, I would say it's highly speculative it as to what speculative. would happen because we don't know. Right. Uh, you know. Uh, Judge Amy Coney Barrett is a constitutional, mm. you know, lawyer who has uh, in, an impeccable judicial record and has been lauded by both both sides of the aisle, uh, by her uh, her colleagues at Notre Dame and by students who had her as a professor. So I think she is well qualified to uh, sit on the court and hear that case. Yeah, and you know, it, 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 some things that she said yesterday in her opening statement made me wonder, you know, and I think a lot of people wonder this, why, why, are, why are pieces of legislation like the ACA ever before the Supreme Court? I mean, we, we all know, you know, that, that the Supreme Court has been, with Marbury versus Madison, they, ever since they've, been a, they've taken the authority to rule on legislation. But if you feel that way, if you don't feel like you should be making policy, that it should be elected officials who make policy. And in this case, elected officials made this policy and this policy has withstood many attempts to repeal it. Why, why should the Supreme Court be involved in this again? Well, because there are pieces of it that th people deem unconstitutional. Mm. You know, when you're talking about, um, f you know, mandating coverage, it was, it was said early on that's not a tax. Well, I think that you could argue that it is. Well, Robert said it was. The, the majority so, said that it so was. So that's my point is <laughs> yeah. that there are pieces of, of ACA that I do think mm. that uh, could be questionable constitutionally mm -hmm. could be a violation of that and so that's why you keep seeing this brought up is because I don't, look I think everyone wants to make sure that we're taking care of uh, low-income families that need health care that's never been the question the question well, you is you oppose Medicaid expansion so that can't be entirely but, uh, true no that that's actually very true and I'll, okay. I'll explain okay. that in a second the the difference is between you know my opponent and I is how do you get there mm -hmm. that's the difference uh, I think that there are a lot of ways that you can utilize things like a health savings account. Instead of providing insurance, let's give an individual a health savings account with a you know, certain amount of dollars in it and let them spend those dollars on health uh, but, related. But if you don't have an insurance policy, I mean, if you're, if, and, and we've had health savings accounts, I mean, that's, that's something that's been around for a long time, very, very long before, um, and it's basically where People have a certain amount of their paycheck withheld, mainly to cover those out-of-pocket expenses, but it's usually, you know, kind of a, a low amount, you know, and currently, under current law, you can't even have one unless you have, I think, a high deductible plan. So what, I guess what you're talking about is you, you create a, a, a vehicle that's similar to a health savings account that you don't have to have a health insurance plan connected Correct. to. So but you still, can most give people, low-income people, couldn't, save enough to pay for like a really expensive and procedure that, or something. And that could be a different piece of this, but you know, if you remember, we have um, hundreds of thousands of Oklahomans that have chronic diseases. Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges that we have, we're a 
fairly unhealthy state, let's get them healthy. Very unhealthy. <laughs> let's, let's get them healthy. Let's get them to the doctor and start managing their diabetes or their you know, heart conditions or um, you know, obesity. You start addressing some of those issues and then these catastrophic uh, types of surgeries or other needs are gonna decline. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, but so to your point, you could offer a large um, you know, amount of dollars every year for them to be able to choose their doctor. One of the things that the ACA promise was you can keep your doctor. I don't think that's been true. Mm -hmm. It also said that you know costs would go down. That didn't happen. I'm paying more now than I ever have before for health care coverage for me and my family, and I have a high deductible. Uh, you know, these are the types of, of challenges. And if you remember, going but, is it, but let me just ask you on that piece right there because before there wasn't a requirement that um, people with pre-existing conditions be covered. So once you put those people in the pool, you know, a lot of them are very expensive. You talked about these chronic conditions. A lot of them are very expensive. So it does drive up the cost for, for other people, but at least those people are being treated is the theory behind it. But you also have the requirements like the, you can't have a lifetime cap anymore. And mm -hmm. you're talking about somebody with cancer or something who with the, today's healthcare costs might, I think they were typically about a million dollars for mm -hmm. your lifetime. Mm -hmm. You could reach that. That's you know feasible. that's feasible. Yeah. Fair you know fairly. Also, you get to keep your kids on um, till they're 26. 26. Mm -hmm. So, you know those things did make there. There's no question that it drove up the cost, made deductibles higher, but prescription drug costs have made it. Higher yeah, too. I'm dealing with that myself. Yeah. Let me just make one comment there okay. about sort of the passage of ACA. You know, if you if you think back to when that was passed, Nancy Pelosi. Um, was was in charge and she actually said we're gonna put this bill uh, up for a vote and it was I think 2,000 pages mm -hmm. and people said wait wait we need time to read it we don't have time for you to read it and, and examine everything we just got to get this passed this is the, people may not remember but this is when the Senate lost the the two-thirds uh, to ward off court um, you know uh, filibuster, filibuster when um, Ted Kennedy died and a Republican replaced Ted Kennedy. So they did you rush were it. You were watching was, all of this back <laughs> then. <laughs> so I think, you know, that, that I think, you know, was, it was sort of passed, you know, undercover in the dark of night uh, with not a lot of uh, time to be able to really look at all of the challenges. And a decade later, we're seeing all of the things that have transpired because of ACA. One thing that I commit is that whatever we do, however we move forward with this, it does have to cover pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. You mentioned prescription drug costs. Um, there are thousands of Oklahomans that have a you know chronic disease. You know, you have to make sure that you're allowing them the medicines that they need to continue to be healthy. Because if we have a healthy population, that means people are going to work. They're, you know, contributing back to society. They're being able to pay for their, you know, for a roof over their head and food and, and you know, for their family. These are good things for all of us. So we, I want Theoretically, to be, health insurance costs could come down then. Too. There you go. Yeah. And you've seen companies across Oklahoma City, you know, and probably others, um, offering incentives for people to actually go, uh, you know, to the gym three times a week and, mm -hmm. and make sure that they're getting, you know, their cholesterol checked sure. to, to keep, you um, keep their health care costs down. Mm -hmm. I do want to maybe take a step back though and you talked about Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that I wasn't for that. I want to be very clear about my position on that because okay. I don't want it to be misconstrued. I was against putting it in the Constitution. That was my issue with it. Uh, I think that my fear is that the federal government, as they have done with other types of federal programs, No Child Left Behind being an education initiative, They've given us the directives, they control the purse strings, they control how we spend the money. And right now, there's a 90% federal match with a 10% state match. My fear, Chris, is that that'll change in the future. And if it goes to 70-30 or 60-40, we have no flexibility mm -hmm. in how to change the program because it's in the Constitution now. And with so are you saying that if it had been a statutory question, you would have supported it? I did. Uh -huh. If you looked at, at Governor Stitt's Medicaid expansion plan mm -hmm. um, back in the, uh, the legislative session, I did support that. Mm -hmm. 
Now, he wanted to do some different things, you know, using some block grants or trying to provide flexibility. Yeah, that Again, was a very specific type of plan, but go ahead. I'm but sorry. yes, yeah. I mean, that to me mm -hmm. made sense. That was a step in the right direction, mm -hmm. and I did support that. So I just want to make sure okay. that there's some clarity on that because I don't want it to be misconstrued. Okay. I don't, it, we're, don't want to run out of time before I ask you about some other things, and that first one being climate change. And what, um, you know, what you think, just two or three different steps that you think, well, let me just ask if you think the U.S. is doing everything it can now to reduce emissions, and of course, global warming is global. It's not, it's not just, but the U.S. does have a responsibility. It's one of the top carbon producing countries. I mean, is it doing everything now? If not, what else could it do? And let me just stop there. Okay, so I think that the science you know, says that climate change is, is mm. real. We have done, I think, an, a tremendous job of trying to ensure that we're doing our part in the world to address, you know, the environment. Mm -hmm. And the, the, you know, pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord, what most people don't realize is that the United States was sort of beholden to this accord, and there are other countries that really weren't meeting the same requirements. So countries like China, India, who have tremendous you know, carbon output. Mm -hmm. Why are we being held to a higher standard and we're trying to meet those needs when other countries aren't? That doesn't mean I don't think that we shouldn't be mindful of the environment, we absolutely should. But I think that we as a country are using free market principles and innovation and technology to really make sure that that happens. 15 years ago, there were very few electric vehicles on the road. Right. Now, two years ago during the Super Bowl advertisements, almost every car company said they were going to a hybrid model right. or, or some sort of EV platform. I see quite a few Teslas around here. There's been quite a, yeah, yeah you see quite a few of those. So that's the kind of thing <clears throat> I want to see. We're being mindful, we're being thoughtful about you know the environment, but we're also using innovation and technology to, to really um, push that forward. You've even seen things like uh, an expansion of you know solar and wind energy across the state of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. That's been you know very well received because we're able to um, you know, to, to lower energy costs for not only Oklahomans, but across the country when we're selling that power. So only, uh, obviously only a certain amount of government, I mean, government mandates do have a role, um, but the market really has, so has uh, yeah, well, the market has, I think, to some extent driven this. I mean, some of the big companies that build their server farms do it only with, renew you know, they power them through renewables and everything. but. But, so, so that's, I think, is talking through that, why would you want to put government mandates in place? And that's what you know, Democrats want to often talk about is, and, and a great example of that is California. Mm -hmm. And Gavin Newsom saying, you know, I don't want any fossil fuel vehicles you know, by 2035. And they have rolling blackouts. And they have rolling blackouts and, and, and energy you know, costs right. that are through the roof. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. You're already seeing you know, EV vehicles you know, make a, um, a presence, in, you know, in their in their communities, but to mandate that will is is a complete 180 from what we should be doing. What so what will your approach be to you know uh, the fossil fuel industry to you know, the oil and gas production industry in Congress? I mean, if there there will be amendments, there are every year on the Interior Spending Bill about drilling, and the, actually the president himself a few weeks ago banned drilling off the Atlantic coast and the Gulf Coast. Uh, in, in, in off of Florida, where his his new home state, what 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 do you say about that? I mean, there's a lot of discussion in this race about some votes that um, Congressman Horn took about banning offshore drilling. What's what's your position on offshore drilling? Well, I think that we should be mindful again of the environment. But let's be clear. We spent decades trying to become energy independent in this country. Mm -hmm. There was a big push for that for a variety of reasons, whether that's national security, you know, um, whether that's making sure that you know our industries are, you know, we still use a lot of, of fossil fuel products, petroleum products, and across the globe, mm -hmm. banning um, drilling and exploration becomes problematic because what's going to happen at some point is you're going to start being reliant on foreign oil again. And I think that's where I have a real, there's a real difference uh, in my position in this race uh, and my opponent. You know, uh, her predecessors, Democrat predecessors, actually supported drilling uh, off of, of the coast and as well as drilling in Anwar. Um, I think it's, it's difficult 
to say that you're for um, an industry when you voted against them every single time. What about the argument that the offshore drillers are just multinationals now, that it's not like the, you know, Oklahoma City's and Oklahoma itself are home to a lot of independents that are now really involved in, uh, you know, mostly drilling in, in shale formations in the United States. Does it matter to you whether their home home state companies or or not well i mean it impacts the energy industry regardless mm -hmm. of whether they are based here in oklahoma city or they're based outside because it goes back to the ability for us to continue to be energy independent mm -hmm. regardless of the company I want to switch to taxes as um last week the congresswoman um has a, had a plan that she proposed to reverse the tax breaks for those making over four hundred thousand to increase what's called the earned income tax credit, which is for what they call the working poor. People that don't who work but don't make much get a, a refundable credit uh, uh, when they file. You voted for a tax package to, to um, kind of stem the bleeding um, of, of education um, and provide a teacher pay raise. Two, two teacher pay raises. Two teacher pay raises. <laughs> one this one this year, right? And one in 2018 for okay. six thousand, and one in right. 2019, 2019 for an additional 1,200. Yeah. Are there any circumstances that you can see yourself voting for a tax package in Congress? I mean, even if it were most of it was just to address the deficit, address the not the, the yearly deficits that that are reaching a trillion dollars. You know, I think there's yeah. better ways to do that. Um, Certainly, the difference between the federal government and the state government is that we have a balanced budget. Mm -hmm. You can't spend what you don't have. And that's not, not counting bond issues. Not counting bond <laughs> issues. That's, well, those are local, typically municipal you know, types but of there things. There are state bonds. There are state bonds, yeah. but, but for, the most, for part, the most part, you can't yeah. spend what you don't have. Right. Uh, and that's why the um, revenue that was generated um, in 2018 was important because we were, we had had, you know, my first couple of years in the state Senate, it was a $600 million budget shortfall followed by a $900 billion budget shortfall. Actually, I think it back to it was 1.2 the second year, 1.2 billion, and then a $900 million the third year. Um, and, and we kept, you know, we, kept, we couldn't keep pace. And we also have a cap on our rainy day fund. Mm -hmm. And that's a constitutional cap. So we had exhausted the rainy day fund and we were unable to really um, make sure that we were funding core services um, to the level that I felt it needed to be. On the federal level, it's a very different conversation, though, because we have uh, unlimited spending. There's no balanced budget amendment. There's no cap on that. So I think there are ways to look at trying to reduce uh, expenses, still paying for core services, but I think it can be done. It's just going to take a lot of work. Look, I've had to <laughs> take some tough votes in the legislature. Um, You've seen the attack ads uh, on me from Club for Growth because of a lot of those mm -hmm. votes. It's not easy, uh, but it, I think it's necessary. We can't continue to pile on to this deficit. It's well, just I was going to say Republicans seem to, they, they're more serious about that under Democratic presidents. And then when you have a Republican president and Republican Congress that's piling them up, you don't hear that much about it. But, well, uh, I haven't served. <laughs> I, 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 know, I've only, I know you have So I've only served on the state level, and that state uh, level has always been a balanced budget, and I think that's the way that you know we should operate. If you Langford talks it. about it, and obviously Coburn, if Senator Coburn were still was, in there, yeah. it would be every day. Yeah. But um, really, they just kind of forget about that. It's, well, you know, right now I think uh, we're under unique circumstances. Sure. This is a difficult situation and we've got to continue to make sure our economy is uh, turning along, especially with, uh, you know, continuation of COVID. We talked about the CARES package originally. I think there needs to be, you know, a, a we need to take a look at what else we need to be doing to keep the economy going. Uh, but we also, this is unsustainable for the long term and you've got to really start making some tough decisions. Well, is that, just to finish this up, I mean, is there an argument that um, the wealth gap to some extent is kind of exacerbated by the tax code? Uh, I don't know if, if I would um, say that that's a piece of it. I think there's a lot of pieces. It's also a very complicated tax code. No, it isn't. <laughs> but I think the, you know, the example a lot of people would, would use is like the Warren Buffett example. I, I pay a lower tax rate than my secretary because all of his income is capital gains income investment income, mm -hmm. I should say. Mm -hmm. Well, his secretary, it's income tax income, which is taxed at a higher rate. I mean, is that, is, I mean, is, is that desirable? 
I'd have to do some the deep dive into to figure out what makes you know what makes sense. Um, so I, I don't know that I have a, a answer one way or another. Okay, on that. I, I want to speed through a couple more topics and let you go. Um, local policing or policing. I know that's mostly a local uh, local issue. How citizens want to spend their local tax money and how they want their local police department to to keep them safe. Is there anything in the, at the federal level after, and, and I'm sure you know, these images are burned into all of our, our minds, is there anything that, that you think Congress, uh, you know, the national legislature should do? You know, it is a, a local issue, mm -hmm. and I think that, the, um, that Congress could look at additional funding you know, there's been this notion to defund the police. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if you talk to citizens, that's not at all what they're interested in. But what I about was, the question of qualified immunity? I mean... Uh, well, my, my opponent actually voted to, to take that away. Right. You know, I think that's one of the reasons why the state federal, or um, uh, the Fraternal Order of Police, uh, over 6,000 law enforcement officers endorsed me in this race because they felt like, you know, taking that away jeopardized them and their families. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm very honored and proud to have that. Here, here's the thing that I think we need to think through. Um, certainly, there are bad apples in every profession, whether it's, you know, medicine, teaching, you know, uh, legal profession, police. Mm -hmm. And they have to be, um, if, if they have committed a crime, they have to be, you know, held to, to the letter of the law on that. But we can't defund the police. Mm -hmm. That's a, um, a notion that I don't subscribe to at all. And probably I was, few do. I mean, there's not really. But you, but you saw it in Norman. Yeah. I mean, I, that I, was pretty. Yeah, that's true. Down the road, they did, they yeah. did choose to. And, and, I, and I will say this. I was actually walking my neighborhood a couple of months ago, and one of my neighbors is a 37-year veteran uh, of law enforcement. And I stopped and I said, you know, sir, I want you to know how much I appreciate your um, you know, commitment to our community. He is African American, mm -hmm. and he said it's really difficult for him to see this notion that people don't like the police. He said, "I've committed my life to making sure that I protect my community. Doesn't matter what your skin color is. Shouldn't matter what my skin color is. But there's this notion that 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 plays into it somehow." And he said, "I'm just trying to do my job here." Surely he has some understanding of why you know, after what we've seen after years and years of why some people might distrust them in some neighborhoods. You know, certainly, but I think that that can be addressed if we have more training. Mm -hmm. he, he shared with me um, that he's been a part of, of this particular um, uh, law enforcement community for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm blessed because our division actually does a minimum quarterly training to address things like, you know, um, de-escalation tactics or how to deal with issues in the field as it relates to mental health or substance abuse or those sorts of things. He said there are communities out there that they don't get any additional training. Mm -hmm. You know, they're very limited on funds. The other thing is body cams. People don't realize that the body cams are not cheap and when you're having to outfit every officer 24-7 and keep that video on file for months and years at a time, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. And that's protection for the officer, but also the individual that's you know uh, involved in that particular uh, situation. Right. Those are the things that we should be thinking about as we talk about making sure that we're protecting our communities. Are there? Do we have some racial divides? Yes. Should we be having some really tough conversations about race? You bet we should. Um, that's I think that needs to continue. That work you know has started, but we've got a long way to go, and I want to see that happen. But that doesn't mean that we should just walk away from an entire, um, uh, you know, s uh, public safety entity because we're upset with, with what's happened. We've got to address it head on. The president uh, endorsed you Sunday night by tweet, I guess. Um, uh, not, not a surprise. It looked like he was doing a whole list of them. Um, does that help you or hurt you in the 5th District of Oklahoma? You know, I think it's, it, 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 the president, you know, won this district by 13% in 2016. Um, you know, I think he wants to see Republicans um, take over the House and take the gavel away from Pelosi, who 
I think we, many of us believe is very partisan in these last you know, couple of years uh, and try to actually get stuff done. Senator, thanks so much. I really appreciate you coming in. Next, second debate tomorrow night, October 14th. Correct. I think. Yeah. And so one more after that, right? 20, yeah, on the right. 20th, uh, Fox 25. Okay. Yep. So. And thanks so much for watching uh, Conversations with Candidates on Oklahoman.com. Again, tomorrow, Democratic U.S. Senate candidate Abby Broyles. On Thursday, U.S. Senator Jim Inhofe. These interviews, uh, the one with Senator Bice, will be available um, online on our website and on our YouTube site, as well as all the others. Thanks so much.